You're watching the Everything Network. The Genovese crime family is one of the five families that rule organized crime in America with an iron fist as part of the American Mafia, or La Cosa Nostra. The Genovese crime family has been nicknamed the Ivy League and Rolls Royce of organized crime. They are rivaled in size by only the Gambino crime family and are matched in terms of power, wealth, and influence. They have maintained tremendous power and control over many mafia families outside of New York, including the Patriarca, Buffalo, and Philadelphia crime families. The Genovese crime family is the most sophisticated, intelligent, and secretive of the five families and one of the largest and most powerful criminal organizations in the world. The Genovese crime family is widely known for their intelligence, efficiency, and keeping a very low profile. They are also famous for their astronomically ingenious ideas and ways of making an extraordinary amount of money in a short period of time and inventing highly lucrative criminal ventures. The Genovese crime family has been a multi-billion dollar international organized crime empire for 70 years. Finding new ways to make money in the 21st century, the Genovese family took advantage of lax due diligence by banks during the housing spike with a wave of mortgage frauds. Prosecutors say loan shark victims obtained home equity loans to pay off debts to their mob bankers. The family found ways to use new technology to improve on old reliable illegal gambling, with customers placing bets through offshore sites via the internet. The modern family was founded by Charles Luciano, but after 1957 it was renamed after boss Vito Genovese. Originally in control of the waterfront on the west side of Manhattan, including the Fulton Fish Market, the family was run for years by the Odd Father. Vincent Gigante, who feigned insanity by shuffling unshaven through New York's Greenwich Village, wearing a tattered bathrobe and muttering to himself incoherently. Although the leadership of the Genovese family seemed to have been in limbo after the death of Gigante in 2005. As of a 2018 report on the American Mafia, the Genovese crime family is the largest and most powerful mafia family in America and still appears to be the most secretive and sophisticated crime family and also remains extremely powerful and highly organized. Unique in today's mafia, the organization has benefited greatly from members following the Code of Omata. While many mobsters from across the country have testified against their crime families since the early 1990s, the Genovese family has only had five members turn state's evidence in its history. Since its beginning, the Genovese crime family has been widely known as the smartest and most secretive mafia family in America. The Gambino crime family has been considered to be the most powerful of the five families. However, the Genovese crime family is considered by the FBI to be the most powerful and influential of the five families. Originated from the Morello crime family of East Harlem, the first mafia family in New York City. The Morellos started arriving in New York from the village of Corleone, Sicily around 1892, when only a few thousand Italians lived in New York. The first incarnation of what would become the Morello crime family was the 107th Street Mob, established by Giuseppe Morello, later joined by associate Ignazio Lupo, who became underboss. Morello's lieutenants were his half-brothers, Nicholas, Vincenzo, and Shiro. By the early 1900s, the Morello family was involved with counterfeiting, extortion, kidnapping, and other traditional mafia activities in Manhattan. As the Morello family increased in power and influence, bloody territorial conflicts arose with other Italian criminal gangs in New York. Their new rival was the Neapolitan Camorra organization, which consisted of two small Brooklyn gangs run by Pellegrino Morano and Alessandro Volero. Unlike the Sicilian Morellos, the Camorra was composed of immigrants from Naples, Italy. 
Initially, the Morellos and the Camorra collaborated to divide up criminal activities in Manhattan. However, when Giuseppe Morello and Lupo went to prison in 1909 for counterfeiting, Morano decided that he could kill the remaining Morello leadership and take the family's more lucrative rackets. Morano's move resulted in the bloody Mafia Camorra War from 1914 to 1918. By 1918, law enforcement had sent many Camorra gang members to prison, decimating the Camorra in New York and ending the war. Although the Morellos had won this gang conflict, they had suffered losses also, including the 1916 assassination of boss Nicholas Morello. The Morellos now faced stronger rivals than the Camorra. With the passage of Prohibition in 1919 and the outlawing of alcohol sales, the Morello family regrouped and built a lucrative bootlegging operation in Manhattan. However, by the early 1920s, the Morello family no longer existed. A powerful Sicilian rival, Salvatore de Quila, had declared a death sentence on Giuseppe Morello and Ignazio Lupo, both recently released from prison, forcing them to flee to Italy for safety. When the two men returned to New York, they relied on Giuseppe Masseria, a new Morello ally, to kill Salvatore de Quila. However, the price of Masseria's help was to essentially take over the Morello family. During the mid-1920s, Giuseppe Masseria continued to expand his bootlegging, extortion, loan sharking, and illegal gambling rackets throughout New York. To operate and protect these rackets, Masseria recruited many ambitious young mobsters. These mobsters included future Cosa Nostra powers Charles Luciano, Frank Costello, Frankie Yale, Joe Adonis, Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, and Carlo Gambino. Masseria was willing to take all Italian-American recruits, no matter where they had originated in Sicily or Italy. Masseria's strongest rival in New York was Salvatore Maranzano, leader of the Castellamare del Golfo Sicilian organization in Brooklyn. A recent arrival from Sicily, Maranzano had strong support from elements of the Sicilian Mafia and was a traditionalist mafiosi. He recruited Sicilian mobsters only, preferably from the Castellamare's clan. Maranzano's top lieutenants included future family bosses Joseph Bonanno, Joseph Profaci, and Stefano Magadino. By 1928, the Castellamare's war between Masseria and Maranzano had begun. By the late 1920s, more than 60 mobsters on both sides had been murdered. On April 15, 1931, Giuseppe Masseria was murdered in a Coney Island, Brooklyn restaurant, reportedly by members of Luciano's crew. Angry over broken promises from Masseria, Luciano had secretly conspired with Maranzano to plot Masseria's assassination. On the day of the murder, Luciano was allegedly eating dinner with Masseria at a restaurant. After Luciano went to the restroom, his hitman arrived and murdered Masseria. With Masseria's death, the Castellamarie's war had ended. Now in control of New York, Salvatore Maranzano took several important steps to solidify his victory. He reorganized the Italian-American gangs of New York into five new families, structured after the hierarchical and highly disciplined mafia families of Sicily. Maranzano's second big change was to appoint himself as the boss of all the families. As part of this reorganization, Maranzano designated Charles Luciano as boss of the old Morello Masseria crime family. However, Luciano and other mob leaders privately objected to Maranzano's dictatorial role. Maranzano soon found out about Luciano's discontent and ordered his assassination. Discovering that he was in danger, Luciano plotted Maranzano's assassination with Maranzano trustee Gaetano Lucchese. On September 10, 1931, Jewish gangsters provided by Luciano ally Maya Lansky shot and stabbed Maranzano to death in his Manhattan office. Luciano was now the most powerful mobster in the United States. After Maranzano's murder, Charles Luciano created a new governing body for the Cosa Nostra families, the Commission. 
The commission consisted of representatives from each of the five families, the Chicago outfit, and the Magadino crime family of Buffalo, New York. Luciano wanted the commission to mediate disputes between the families and prevent future gang wars. Although nominally a democratic body, Luciano and his allies actually controlled the commission throughout the 1930s. As head of the new Luciano family, Luciano appointed Vito Genovese as his underboss, or second in command, and Frank Costello as his consigliere or advisor. With the new structure in place, the five New York families would enjoy several decades of peace and growth. In 1935, Lucky Luciano was indicted on pandering charges by New York District Attorney Thomas Dewey. Many observers believed that Luciano would never have directly involved himself with prostitutes and that the case was fraudulent. During the trial, Luciano made a tactical mistake in taking the witness stand, where the prosecutor interrogated him for five hours about how he made his living. In 1936, Luciano was convicted and sentenced to 30 to 50 years in prison. Although in prison, Luciano continued to run his crime family. His underboss Genovese now supervised the day-to-day -day family activities. In 1937, Vito Genovese was indicted on murder charges and fled the country to Italy. After Genovese's departure, Costello became the new acting boss of the Luciano family. During World War II, federal agents asked Luciano for help in preventing enemy sabotage on the New York waterfront and other activities. Luciano agreed to help but in reality provided insignificant assistance to the Allied cause. After the end of the war, the arrangement with Luciano became public knowledge. To prevent further embarrassment, the government agreed to deport Luciano on condition that he never return to the United States. In 1946, Luciano was taken from prison and deported to Italy, never to return to the United States. Costello became the effective boss of the Luciano family. During the 1940s, Costello allowed Luciano associates Maya Lansky and Bugsy Siegel to expand the family business in Southern California and build the first modern casino resort in Las Vegas. When Siegel failed to open the resort on time, his mob investors allegedly sanctioned his murder. Siegel was a driving force behind the development of the Las Vegas Strip. He was influential within the Jewish mob, along with his childhood friend and fellow gangster Maya Lansky, and he also held significant influence within the Italian-American Mafia and the largely Italian-Jewish National Crime Syndicate. Described as handsome and charismatic, he became one of the first front-page celebrity gangsters. Bugsy was one of the founders and leaders of the infamous hit team, known as Murder Incorporated. Bugsy became a bootlegger during American Prohibition, and in 1936 he left New York and moved out west to California to set up operations for the family. His time as a mobster during this period was mainly as a hitman and muscle, as he was noted for his prowess with guns and violence. In 1941, he was tried for the murder of friend and fellow mobster Harry Greenberg, who had turned informant. However, he was acquitted in 1942. He handled and financed some of the original casinos. He assisted developer William R. Wilkerson's Flamingo Hotel after Wilkerson ran out of funds. Siegel assumed control of the project and managed the final stages of construction. The Flamingo opened on December 26, 1946 in a driving rainstorm, resulting in a poor reception and technical difficulties, and it soon closed. It reopened in March 1947 with a finished hotel, but by then his mob partners were convinced that an estimated $1 million of the construction budget overrun had been skimmed by Siegel's girlfriend Virginia Hill, or by both of them. On June 20, 1947, 
Siegel was shot dead by a sniper through the window of Hill's Linden Drive mansion in Beverly Hills, California. During the reign of Frank Costello, the Luciano crime family controlled much of the bookmaking, loan sharking, illegal gambling, and labor racketeering activities in New York City. Costello wanted to increase the family involvement in lucrative financial schemes. He was less interested in low-grossing criminal activities that relied on brutality and intimidation. Costello believed in diplomacy and discipline and in diversifying family interests. Nicknamed the Prime Minister of the Underworld, Costello controlled much of the New York waterfront and had tremendous political connections. While working for the Morello gang, Frank Costello met Charlie Lucky Luciano, the Sicilian leader of Manhattan's Lower East Side gang. The two Italians immediately became friends and partners. Several older members of Luciano's mob family disapproved of this growing partnership. They were mostly old-school mafiosi who were unwilling to work with anyone who was not Italian, and skeptical at best about working with non-Sicilians. To Luciano's shock, they warned him against working with Costello, whom they called the Dirty Calabrian. Along with Italian-American associates Vito Genovese and Tommy Three Finger Brown Lucchese, and Jewish associates Maya Lansky and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, the gang became involved in robbery, theft, extortion, gambling, and narcotics. The Luciano Costello Lansky Siegel Alliance prospered even further with the passage of Prohibition in 1920. The gang went into bootlegging, backed by criminal financier Arnold the Brain Rothstein. The young Italian's success let them make business deals with the leading Jewish and Irish criminals of the era, including Dutch Schultz, Oni the Killer Madden, and William Big Bill Dwyer. Arnold became a mentor to Costello, Luciano, Lansky and Siegel, while they conducted bootlegging business with Bronx beer baron Schultz. In 1922, Costello, Luciano and their closest Italian associates joined the Sicilian crime family, led by Joe the Boss Masseria, a top Italian underworld crime boss. By 1924, Costello had become a close associate of Hell's Kitchen's Irish crime bosses Dwyer and Madden. He became involved in their rum-running operations, known as the Combine. This might have prompted him to change his last name to the Irish Costello. In 1925, Costello became a U.S. citizen. On November 19, 1926, Costello and Dwyer were indicted on federal bootlegging charges. They were accused of bribing two U.S. Coast Guardsmen, presumably so that they would not disturb the unloading of liquor from boats in New York Harbor. The largest boat in the Combine fleet could carry 20,000 cases of liquor. In January 1927, the jury deadlocked on the bootlegging charges for Dwyer and Costello. In 1926, Dwyer was convicted of bribing a Coast Guard official and sentenced to two years in jail. After Dwyer was imprisoned, Costello and Madden took over the Combine's operations. This caused friction between Madden and a top Dwyer lieutenant, Charles Higgins, who believed he should have been running the Combine instead of Costello. Thus, the Manhattan Beer Wars began between Higgins on one side and Costello, Madden, and Schultz on the other. Higgins was born in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn, New York in 1897. Learning pickpocketing and petty theft as a child, by 1916, he had been arrested for assault twice, but was put on probation. At the beginning of Prohibition, he had formed a small-time gang, which started to operate outside of Bay Ridge after taking control of Big Bill Dwyer's bootlegging operations with partner Frank Costello in 1927, importing high-quality Canadian liquor for Dwyer's high-society clientele. By the mid-1920s, Higgins' rum-running operations included a fleet of taxis and loading trucks, as well as several planes and numerous speedboats which were used in smuggling alcohol into the United States from Canada, one of which, the cigarette, was described as the fastest rum runner in New York waters. Higgins, 
himself a flying enthusiast and licensed pilot, often used his planes for personal use. During a business trip in Baltimore, Higgins was a witness to a gang fight between rival bootleggers while visiting a local speakeasy, and, while deciding to leave the premises, he was mistaken for one of the fighting bootleggers and shot in the leg by a local police officer. He reportedly stated, I don't let my boys take risks I don't take, at the scene of many gun battles between himself and Schultz during 1928. During one such incident, Higgins and gunman William Bad Bill Bailey were seen fleeing the scene after fighting rival gunman Brooklyn's Owl Head Cafe at 69th Street and 3rd Avenue, in which a patrolman Daniel J. Maloney was killed in the crossfire by fellow arriving police officers in March 1929. Higgins, Bailey, and another gunman were arrested several weeks later in connection with the death of Brooklyn bootlegger Samuel Orlando, identified by witnesses as the rival gangsters who had gunned Orlando down. By the time of his trial, however, none of the witnesses could be found, and he was acquitted of all charges. Several months later, Higgins and Bailey were shot at in an attempted drive-by shooting by rival gunmen, although the two, driving in another car at the time of the attack, were able to escape their pursuers. A colourful character in public life, Higgins made public appearances and often posed for news photographers, as he dressed in expensive British imported suits and was driven around in various limousines. Although almost always surrounded by bodyguards, Higgins had earned a reputation for recklessness in gang battles, as his offices and residents were known to be well stocked with weapons. When Higgins acquired a shipment of grenades from a military arsenal, he and Legs Diamond used them against Schultz's speakeasies during their battles with the rival gangster. Enjoying extensive political protection from many of New York's politicians and public officials, Higgins was allowed to land his plane at the state prison of Comstock, New York, where he had dinner with childhood friend Warden Joseph H. Wilson. Although Wilson was criticized by then New York Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt, Wilson maintained he had the right to entertain anyone he wanted. In 1931, Higgins led his men into the Manhattan's Blossom Heath Inn on West 57th Street, where he visited the owner, Frank McManus. McManus was the brother of George Hump McManus, a suspect in the 1928 murder of Arnold Rothstein. When Higgins refused to leave, arguing with the owner over a shipment of beer and liquor, a fight broke out in which Higgins suffered serious knife wounds. Although taken to Polyclinic Hospital, Higgins refused to identify his attacker while recuperating. Later that year, Higgins and Bailey were suspected in the death of Robert Whitey Benson, a member of Higgins' organization who was suspected of secretly working for rival Dutch Schultz and informing him on information regarding Higgins' organization, including details on liquor shipments. Although arrested for the murder, the two were once again acquitted due to lack of evidence. On the night of June 18, 1932, after attending his daughter's tap dance recital at the Knights of Columbus Clubhouse in Prospect Park, Higgins was gunned down in the street while trying to protect his seven-year-old daughter. He was taken to the Methodist Episcopal Hospital by a local patrolman and despite police attempts to question him, Higgins refused to answer any questions regarding the shooting and died the following afternoon. At this time, Schultz was also having problems with gangsters Jack Legs Diamond and Vincent Mad Dog Cole, who had begun to rival Schultz and his partners with Higgins's help. Eventually, the Costello Madden Schultz Alliance was destroyed by New York's underworld. In the late 1920s, Johnny Torrio helped to organize a loose cartel of East Coast bootleggers, the Big Seven, in which a number of prominent gangsters, including Costello, Luciano, Abner's Wilman, Joe Adonis, and Maya Lansky played a part.
Vittorio also supported creation of a national body that would prevent the sort of all-out turf wars between gangs that had broken out in Chicago and New York. His idea was well received, and a conference was hosted in Atlantic City by Torrio, Lansky, Luciano and Costello in May 1929. The National Crime Syndicate was created. Costello quickly became one of the biggest earners for the Luciano family and began to carve his own niche in the underworld. He controlled the slot machine and bookmaking operations for the family with associate Philip Dandy Phil Castle. He placed approximately 25,000 slot machines in bars, restaurants, cafes, drugstores, gas stations, and bus stops throughout New York. In 1934, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia confiscated thousands of francs slot machines, loaded them on a barge, and dumped them into the river. Frank's next move was to accept Louisiana Governor Huey Long's proposal to put slot machines throughout Louisiana for 10% of the take. Costello made Castell overseer of the Louisiana slot operation. Castell had the assistance of New Orleans mafioso Carlos Little Man Marcello. Frank brought in millions of dollars in profit from slot machines and bookmaking to the Luciano family. He and Luciano established extensive connections with Tammany Hall leaders early on. Luciano and Costello each shared hotel rooms with Tammany delegates to the 1932 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Costello continued to cultivate those relationships over the next two decades, intervening in Tammany's affairs and collecting favors and pledges of loyalty from those politicians and judges he had helped, including William O'Dwyer, the two-term mayor of New York City in the 1940s. Frank was able, in turn, to use those political debts to his advantage when other New York City crime families came to him for help. The 1951 Kafava Committee hearings on organized crime confirmed what observers of local politics already knew. Senator Kefava concluded that Carmine de Sapio, leader of Tammany Hall, was assisting Costello and that he had become influential in decisions made by the Tammany Hall Council. De Sapio admitted to having met Costello several times, but insisted that politics was never discussed. In 1936, Lucky was convicted of running a prostitution ring and was sentenced for up to 30 to 50 years in state prison. He attempted to run the crime family from prison with the help of Costello and Lansky, but found it too difficult. With Luciano's imprisonment, Genovese became acting boss of the Luciano crime family. In 1937, Genovese fled to Italy to avoid prosecution for a 1934 murder. Luciano then appointed Costello as acting boss. Costello's underboss was his cousin, Willie Moretti. Genovese returned to the United States in 1945. After the 1934 murder charges were dismissed following the death of two witnesses, Genovese tried to convince Luciano to become a titular boss of bosses and let Genovese run everything. Luciano not only rejected Genovese's proposal, but kept Costello and Moretti as acting boss and underboss. From May 1950 to May 1951, the US Senate conducted a large-scale investigation of organized crime, commonly known as the Kefava Hearings, chaired by Senator Estes Kefava of Tennessee. Costello attempted to minimize the impact of these hearings on his reputation when he was called as a witness, refusing to allow his face to be filmed during his question. After sparring with the lawyers for the committee for hours on the first day, he walked out of the hearing on the second day, claiming that he had a sore throat. When he returned to be questioned several days later, he refused to answer questions about his net worth. Costello was eventually convicted of contempt of the Senate and sentenced to 18 months in prison for his refusal to answer questions. The Kefauver hearings also led to the murder of Willie Moretti on October 4, 1951, on the orders of the Mafia Commission. The members of the commission were concerned with Moretti's erratic behavior before the Senate committee and worried that Moretti's advancing syphilis was affecting his brain and might lead him to talk to the press. Costello appointed Genovese as the new underboss 
after Moretti's murder. In 1952, the government began proceedings to strip Costello of his US citizenship, and he was indicted for evasion of $73,407 in income taxes between 1946 and 1949. He was sentenced to five years in prison and fined $20,000. In 1954, Costello appealed the conviction and was released on $50,000 bail. From 1952 to 1961, he was in and out of half a dozen federal and local prisons and jails. His confinement interrupted by periods when he was out on bail pending determination of appeals. In 1956, Joe Adonis, a powerful Costello ally, chose deportation to Italy over a long prison sentence. His departure left Costello weakened. Adonis and Luciano was controlling bootlegging in Broadway and Midtown Manhattan. At its height, the operation grossed $12 million in one year and employed 100 workers. Adonis also bought car dealerships in New Jersey. When customers bought cars from his dealerships, the salesman would intimidate them into buying protection insurance for the vehicle. Adonis soon moved into cigarette distribution, buying up vending machines by the hundreds and stocking them with stolen cigarettes. He ran his criminal empire from Joe's Italian Kitchen, a restaurant that he owned in Brooklyn. By 1932, Adonis was also a major criminal power in Brooklyn. Despite his wealth, he still participated in jewelry robberies, a throwback to his early criminal career on the streets. In 1932, Joe allegedly participated in the kidnapping and brutal beating in Brooklyn of Isidore Juffa and Isak Wapinski. In 1931, he had lent the two men money for investment and kidnapped them in 1932 after deciding that he should be receiving a higher profit. Two days after the kidnappings, Adonis released Juf and Wapinski after receiving a $5,000 ransom payment. A month later, Wapinski died of internal injuries from being assaulted. Adonis placed many politicians and high-ranking police officers on his payroll. Adonis used his political influence to assist members of the Luciano crime family, such as Luciano and Genovese, and mob associates such as Maya Lansky and Louis Lepke Bucalta, the head of Murder Inc. As a syndicate board member, Adonis, along with Bucalta, may have been responsible for assigning some murder contracts to Murder Inc. Joe did lots of things, handled lots of problems behind the scenes, and was very important to Costello during his time. But Genovese still had to neutralize one more powerful Costello ally, Anastasia, who had taken over the Mangano crime family after the disappearance of boss Vincent Mangano and the murder of his brother Philip Mangano on April 14, 1951. In early 1957, Vito Genovese decided to move on Costello. Genovese ordered Vincent Gigante to murder Costello, and on May 2, 1957, Gigante shot and wounded Costello outside his apartment building. The altercation persuaded Costello to relinquish power to Don Vito and retire. He then controlled what is now called the Genovese crime family. A doorman identified Vincent Gigante as the gunman, but in 1958, Costello testified that he was unable to recognize his assailant. Giganti was acquitted of attempted murder. On October 25, 1957, Anastasia was murdered at the barber shop of the Park Sheraton Hotel at 56th Street and 7th Avenue in Manhattan. Carlo Gambino was expected to be proclaimed boss of Anastasia's family at the November 14, 1957 Appalachian meeting that Genovese called to discuss the future of Cosa Nostra in light of his takeover. When police raided the meeting, to the detriment of Genovese's reputation, Gambino's appointment was postponed to a later meeting in New York City. In 1959, Genovese was convicted of selling a large quantity of heroin. On April 17, 1959, Genovese was sentenced to 15 years in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. During his retirement, Costello was still known as the Prime Minister of the Underworld. 
he still retained power and influence in New York's mafia and remained busy throughout his final years. Cosa Nostra bosses and old associates such as Gambino and Lucchese still paid visits to Costello at his Waldorf Astoria penthouse, seeking advice on important mafia affairs. Costello's old friend Maya Lansky also kept in touch. Costello occupied himself with gardening and displayed some of his flowers at local horticultural shows. On February 20, 1961, the United States Supreme Court upheld a lower court order that stripped Costello of his U.S. citizenship. But on February 17, 1964, the same court set aside a deportation order for Costello, citing a legal technicality. In early February 1973, Costello suffered a heart attack at his Manhattan home and was rushed to Doctors Hospital in Manhattan, where he died on February 18. Costello's sedate memorial service at a Manhattan funeral home was attended by 50 relatives, friends, and law enforcement agents. Costello is interred in a private mausoleum in St. Michael's Cemetery in East Elmhurst, Queens. In 1974, after his enemy Carmine Galante was released from prison, he allegedly ordered the bombing of the doors to Costello's mausoleum. While serving as boss of the Luciano crime family in the 1950s, Frank Costello suffered from depression and panic attacks. During this period, Costello sought help from a psychiatrist who advised him to distance himself from old associates, such as Genovese, and spend more time with politicians. In the early Having taken control of what was now the Genovese crime family in 1957, Vito Genovese decided to organize a Cosa Nostra conference to legitimize his new position. Held on mobster Joseph Barbara's farm in Appalachian, New York, the Appalachian meeting attracted over 100 mafia members from around the nation. However, local law enforcement discovered the meeting by chance and quickly surrounded the farm. As the meeting broke up, Genovese escaped capture by running through the woods. However, many other high-ranking mobsters were arrested. Cosa Nostra leaders were chagrined by the public exposure and bad publicity from the Appalachian meeting and generally blamed Genovese for the fiasco. Wary of Genovese gaining more power in the Mafia Commission, Carlo Gambino used the abortive Appalachian meeting as an excuse to move against his former ally. Gambino, former Genovese bosses Charles Luciano and Frank Costello, and Lucchese crime family boss Gatano Lucchese, allegedly lured Genovese into a drug distribution scheme that ultimately resulted in his conspiracy indictment and conviction. In 1959, Genovese was sentenced to 15 years in prison on narcotics charges. Genovese, who was the most powerful mafia boss in America, had been effectively eliminated as a rival by Gambino. Genovese would later die in prison. The Genovese family was soon rocked by a second public embarrassment, the United States Senate McClellan hearings. While incarcerated at a federal prison in Atlanta, Genovese soldier Joseph Joe Cargo Valachi believed he was being targeted for murder by the mob on the suspicion that he was an informer. On June 22, 1962, Valachi brutally murdered another inmate with a pipe. Valachi told investigators that he thought the victim was Joseph Joe Beck de Palermo, a Lucchese soldier coming to kill him. To avoid a capital murder trial, Valachi agreed to cooperate with federal prosecutors against the Genovese crime family. He thus became the first Cosa Nostra mobster to publicly affirm the organization's existence. With information from prosecutors, the low-level Valachi was able to testify in nationally televised hearings about the Cosa Nostra's influence over legal enterprises in aid of racketeering and other criminal activities to make huge profit. Valachi also introduced the name Cosa Nostra as a household name. Although Valachi's testimony never led to any convictions, it helped law enforcement by identifying many members of the Genovese and other New York crime families. After Vito Genovese was sent to prison in 1959, 
The family leadership secretly established a ruling panel to run the family in Genovese's absence. This first panel included acting boss Thomas Eboli, underboss Gerardo Catena, and Catena's protege Philip Lombardo. After Genovese died in 1969, Lombardo was named his successor. However, the family appointed a series of front bosses to masquerade as the official family boss. The aim of these deceptions was to confuse both law enforcement and rival crime families as to the true leader of the family. In the late 1960s, Gambino boss Carlo Gambino loaned $4 million to Eboli for a drug scheme in an attempt to gain control of the Genovese family. When Eboli failed to pay back his debt, Gambino, with commission approval, murdered Eboli in 1972. After Eboli's death, Genovese Capo and Gambino ally Frank Thierry was appointed as the new front boss. In reality, the Genovese family created a new ruling panel to run the family. This second panel consisted of Gerardo Catena, Michelle Miranda, and Philip Lombardo. In 1981, Thierry became the first Cosa Nostra boss to be convicted under the new Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. In 1982, Thierry died in prison. After Thierry went to prison in 1981, the Genovese family reshuffled its leadership. The captain of the Manhattan faction, Anthony Salerno, Fat Tony, became the new front boss. Philip Lombardo, the real boss of the family, retired, and Vincent Gigante, the trigger man on the failed Costello hit, took actual control of the family. In 1985, Salerno was convicted in the Mafia Commission trial and sentenced to 100 years in federal prison. After the 1980 murder of Philadelphia crime family boss Angelo Bruno, Vincent Gigante and Philip Lombardo began manipulating the rival factions in the war-torn Philadelphia family. Gigante and Lombardo finally gave their support to Philadelphia mobster Nicodemo Scarfo, who in return gave the Genovese mobsters permission to operate in Atlantic City in 1982. After Vincent Gigante took over the Genovese family, he instituted a new administration structure. Former Salerno protege Vincent Cafaro had turned informer and identified Gigante as the real boss to the FBI so the use of front bosses no longer protected the real leader of the family. In addition, Gigante was unnerved by Anthony Salerno's conviction and long sentence, and decided he needed greater protection. Gigante decided to replace the front boss with a new street boss position. The job of the street boss was to publicly run the family operations on a daily basis under Gigante's remote direction. To insulate himself even further from law enforcement, Gigante started communicating to his men through another new position, the messenger. As a result of these changes, Gigante did not directly communicate with other family mobsters, with the exception of his sons, Vincent Esposito and Andrew Gigante, and a few other close associates. Another Gigante tactic to confuse law enforcement was by pretending insanity. He frequently walked down New York streets in a bathrobe, mumbling incoherently. The Chin succeeded in convincing court-appointed psychiatrists that his mental illness was worsening and avoided several criminal prosecutions. The New York media soon nicknamed Gigante the Oddfather. Gigante reportedly operated from the Triangle Social Club in Greenwich Village in Manhattan. He never left his house during the day fearing that the FBI would sneak in and plant a bug. At night, he would sneak away from his house and conduct family business when FBI surveillance was more lax. Even then, he only whispered to keep from being picked up by wiretaps. To avoid incrimination from undercover surveillance, Gigante decreed that any mobster who spoke his name would face severe punishment. In the case of his own family, anyone who spoke his name would be killed on the spot. When necessary, mobsters would either point to their chins or make a C with thumb and forefinger when referring to him. In this way, Gigante managed to stay on the streets while the city's other four bosses ended up getting long prison terms. 
While the public and media were watching him, other family leaders were running the day-to-day -day operations of the family. Underboss Venero Mangano operated out of Brooklyn and ran the family's windows case rackets. Consigliere Louis Bobby Manor, who operated out of the New Jersey faction of the family, as well as supervising four captains around that area during the 1980s. In 1985, the Chin and other family bosses were shocked and enraged by the murder of Paul Castellano, the Gambino family boss. An ambitious Gambino capo, John Gotti, had capitalized on discontent in that family to murder Castellano and his underboss, Thomas Bellotti, outside a Manhattan restaurant and become the new Gambino boss. Gotti had violated Cosa Nostra protocol by failing to obtain prior approval for the murder from the commission. Vincent had been the triggerman on the last unsanctioned hit on a boss, the hit on Frank Costello. With Castellano dead, Dante now controlled the commission and he decided to kill John Gotti. He and Lucchese crime family boss Vittorio Amuso and consigliere Anthony Casso hatched a scheme to kill Gotti with a car bomb. On April 13, 1986, a bomb exploded in Gambino underboss Frank De Chico's car, killing De Chico. However, John Gotti was not in De Chico's car that day and escaped harm. Although the Chin eventually made peace with Gotti, he remained the most powerful boss in New York. The Genovese family dominated construction and union rackets, gambling rackets, and operations at the Fulton Fish Market and the waterfront operations. During this period, Gigante used intimidation and murder to maintain control of the family. During the early 1990s, law enforcement used several high-profile government informants and witnesses to finally put Gigante in prison. Faced with criminal prosecution, in 1992, Gambino crime family underboss Salvatore Gravano agreed to testify against John Gotti and other Cosa Nostra leaders, including Vincent Gigante. Philadelphia crime family underboss Phil Leonetti also became a government witness and testified that during the 1980s, Vincent had ordered the murders of several Philadelphia associates. Finally, Lucchese underboss Anthony Casso implicated Gigante in the 1986 plan to kill John Gotti, Frank DeSico, and Gene Gotti. While in prison, the chin was recorded as saying that he'd feigned insanity for 40 years. In 1997, Gigante was convicted on racketeering and conspiracy charges and sentenced to 12 years in federal prison. The Genovese family was run by acting boss Matthew Aniello, he received help from Capo's Ernest Muscarella, Dominic Cirillo, and Gigante's older brother, Mario Gigante. On December 19, 2005, Gigante died in prison from heart disease. Since the 1990s, infamous mobsters in top positions of the other five families of NYC have become informants and testified against many mobsters, putting bosses, Capos, and soldiers into prison. The most prominent government witness was Bonanno crime family boss Joseph Massino, who started cooperating in 2005. Genovese underboss Venero Mangano, consigliere Louis Manor, capo James Ida and street boss Laborio Belomo received lengthy prison sentences on murder, racketeering, and conspiracy convictions. During the last decades, US law enforcement systematically broke down the Genovese crime family as well as the other Mafia families. Despite these indictments, the Genovese family remains a formidable power with approximately 250 made men and 14 active crews as of 2005. When Vincent Gigante died in late 2005, the leadership went to Genovese capo Daniel Leo who was apparently running the day-to-day -day activities of the Genovese crime family by 2006. In 2006, Genovese underboss and former Gigante loyalist Venero Mangano was released from prison. That same year, former Gigante loyalist and prominent capo Dominic Cirillo was allegedly promoted to consigliere in prison. By 2008, the Genovese family administration was believed to be whole again. In March 2008, 
Leo was sentenced to five years in prison for loan sharking and extortion. Underboss Venero Mangano is reportedly one of the top leaders within the Manhattan faction of the Genovese crime family. Former acting consigliere Lawrence Dentico was leading the New Jersey faction of the family until convicted of racketeering in 2006. Dentico was released from prison in 2009. In July 2008, one-time Gigante Street boss Laborio Belomo was paroled from prison after serving 12 years. What role Belomo plays in the Genovese hierarchy is open to speculation, but he is likely to have a major say in the running of the family once his tight parole restrictions are over. A March 2009 article in the New York Post claimed Daniel Leo was still acting boss despite his incarceration. It also estimated that the family consists of approximately 270 made members. The Genovese family maintains power and influence in New York, New Jersey, Atlantic City and Florida. It is recognized as the most powerful Cosa Nostra family in the United States. Since the Chin's reign, the Genovese crime family has been so strong and successful because of its continued devotion to secrecy. According to the FBI, many family associates don't know the names of family leaders or even other associates. This information lockdown makes it more difficult for the FBI to gain incriminating information from government informants. According to the FBI, the Genovese family has not had an official boss since the Chin's death. Law enforcement considers Leo to be the acting boss, Venero Mangano the underboss, and Dominic Cirillo the consigliere. The Genovese family is known for placing top CAPA regimes in leadership positions to help the administration run the day-to-day -day activities of the crime family. At present, Capos Laborio Belomo, Ernest Muscarella, Dominic Cirillo, and Lawrence Dentico hold the greatest influence within the family and play major roles in its administration. The Manhattan and Bronx factions, the traditional powers in the family, still exercise that control today. If you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to the channel, and also don't forget to click on the notification bell, so you'll be up to date on all videos released from the Everything Network.